program is brought to you in association with First National Bank of Botswana. Welcome to the program. Tonight on First Issues, we discuss the economic impact of gender-based and intimate partner violence, the statistics, cause and effect, and of course, a way forward. Gender-based violence affects all of us one way or another. You may be a victim or know that one lady at work who seems to have a black eye every other day, but gives flimsy explanations like they slipped and fell, but later died. That man who came into work one morning with a swollen split lip and said he bit himself. You find out after some time that their partners are abusive towards them, and not just verbally or emotionally, but also physically. The facts are, gender-based violence is one of the most widespread human rights violations in the entire world, and it knows no economic, social, gender or national boundaries. Currently, statistics state that an estimated one in every three women would have experienced either physical or sexual abuse at least once in her lifetime. While the statistics are not as high for men, they are still significant at one in every five. The thing is, the effects of gender-based and intimate partner violence reach farther than just the families of the victims or the communities within which they live. The conflicts also affect the broader economy as it hinders productivity and economic activity and destabilizes institutions, resulting in adverse negative effects well after the conflict has subsided. Our guest this evening is forensic psychologist Dr. Morekwe Selemowe, who will give intimate insight into the characteristics that might indicate that a person is an abuser and the kind of impact abuse has on victims. She will further share the type of interventions she believes are needed to adequately address and possibly arrest this growing global concern. Doctor, thank you so much for coming on First Issues and affording us your time today. We're talking the socio-economic impacts of um, gender-based violence and intimate partner violence. Let us firstly start by understanding the characteristics of um, a perpetrator or an abuser. No, thank you for inviting me. I think, um, yes, people call it GBV, intim in intimate partner violence. But just looking at who actually engages in such acts, it's actually very broad. But there are certain characteristics that people would actually outline as things to look out for. Uh, for a person who um, emotionally is not able to regulate their emotions, right? Um, it could be someone who's very controlling, controlling in the sense that they would want to control another person in terms of what they do, who they speak to, when do they come home, um, and even just simple things like what you wear. So very controlling. And then uh, emotionally, in terms of emotional uh, regulation, somebody who is very explosive. Explosive at little things, big things. So you never really know when uh, and how they are going to actually respond in terms of engagement with that person. Uh, the person who's manipulative, uh, very manipulative, they would do something and then later on apologize and promise to change. Um, and at times we also look at what has happened maybe probably in the life of that individual. Maybe sometimes we, we see that uh, uh, perpetrators are people who have actually experienced trauma themselves and therefore they have not had a chance to actually deal with traumatic events in their lives. Um, people that have been bullied, for example, uh, tend to actually have those explosive uh, behaviors if they've not dealt with the trauma of being bullied. Um, it could be somebody who's socially awkward sometimes. And at times, it's just you and me, people that we see as ordinary and uh, without necessarily thinking more about what is that ordinary to you and me. So. It, it is um, various 
characteristics that we, we look at. There's no one thing that we could say this is an abuser, but there are certain indicators in terms of who's more likely to be an abuser. Without sounding or seeming like we are blaming the victim or sympathizing with the abuser or legitimizing their actions, can this form of abuse be a response to something that the victim said or did? It is uh, a topic that sometimes becomes controversial. Are we blaming the victim? Uh, but there are certain things that we look at in terms of what are the things that um, a person has or does that might contribute to them staying in an abusive relationship. Maybe we can look at it from that end. Sometimes uh, people that, like I said, who have been abused tend to stay in relationships that are abused, abusive. Um, and sometimes because of their lack of interpersonal skills, they, they are less likely to have choices, uh, make choices that are more informed, or even choosing people that are in their social circles that are good for them. Right? Um, and then uh, the, the thing of shame. Shame is one of the things that actually contributes to why people actually remain in abusive relationships. Um, sometimes we see that you know, for partners, whether men or women, lack of financial freedom sometimes can actually contribute to people saying, you know what, where would I go? Uh, this person provides if that is the case. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of times in uh, marriages, people stay in abusive relationships thinking that they're doing it for the children. Um, and, and a lot of times they're not doing kids a favor. So there are those different reasons as to maybe why people are likely to stay in abusive relationships as compared to us, are we blaming them? So it is coming from the understanding of what is going on with this person mm -hmm. that might be contributing to them just feeling stuck or being stuck as compared to us, are we blaming the victim? We are not blaming the victim. We come from that understanding that as a lot of mental health issues do contribute to either the perpetrator or the victim being in an, in an abusive relationship. In the long term, what are we eventually going to see as consequences of gender-based violence and intimate partner violence on the economy as a whole? It does uh, impact us as a society, one. Uh, productive citizens are impacted. Uh, you can imagine somebody coming to work uh, uh, having been beaten at around 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, that a person is not going to be productive. We have lost lives. I think it is the one thing that we really don't talk about. When we look at just statistics in the last five years, there has been a lot of lives that have been lost because of GBV. I think for me, it's, it's, a, it's a hallmark. Uh, we've seen research showing that as Botswana, we are the most unhappy people. Um, in, in, and that impacts productivity. We look at mental health as something that is an ingredient to productivity in the workplace. Families also lose uh, providers, um, lose people that uh, contribute in terms of just the functioning of families. So it does definitely contribute a lot in terms or impact uh, the economy of our country. Ultimately, what do you propose? to be a solution or what can be a solution to this ever-growing problem that might end up becoming a pandemic? We have a lot of interventions for victims, uh, which is good. I think we are neglecting the root issue, which is with perpetrators. Uh, we need to maybe do research uh, to profile who is likely to be uh, a perpetrator? What are the experiences of those perpetrators? So that we, we formulate uh, informed interventions. Right now, there are no interventions for perpetrators. Yeah, and therefore you can imagine if we are not necessarily focusing on the perpetrators, we are just focusing on the surface of the issue. A lot of our men's mental health is not in the forefront in terms of our interventions. That is why we have a lot of violence, you know, outside just uh, GBV being conducted by men. 
uh, and it is the lack of focus in terms of thinking about men's mental health, in my opinion. Um, even when people come out of uh, correctional facilities or prisons, which is mostly men, we don't have those interventions that ensure that they don't go back to engaging in the same behaviors that took them into uh, correctional facilities. So that aspect, and we are not saying that uh, we, we, we legitimize that behavior, but coming to have an understanding as to what contributes to that would definitely go a long way as compared to just focusing on the victims. I think uh, that is where a lot of communities we make mistakes without focusing on how do we eradicate where the problem really starts. It's not even just about the perpetrator because even from a society point of view, what is the society contributing in terms of uh, sustaining this violence. Uh, so we have to be holistic in looking at the perpetrator or the victim. Let us talk about, like you said, the mental health well-being of men and how the avenues of where men can talk about their own experiences as being victims is quite limited. Just to add on to the point you've just made. Yeah, I'm glad that you're asking because men do get abused. Yeah, that's the unfortunate part is that we do not create conducive environments for men to be men, I would say. Yeah, for men to be human. Yeah, for men to be human because they do feel. I think uh, we usually say men up. I would say men speak. Mm. Um, uh, one of the things as to why we don't have a, a statistics indicating this uh, pandemic in terms of men being abused is the shame that uh, they experience when they talk about my girlfriend abuses me. Women do abuse men, whether it's financially, whether it's socially, whether it's physically and psychologically. Um, we see a lot of men uh, bottling up because they don't have channels as compared to women uh, to be allowed to speak up. Um, they are not allowed to actually emote or maybe allowed to, to express their emotions. Uh, only when they are violent do we then pay attention. When a man is crying, we don't pay attention. When they become violent, we pay attention. And therefore, it is teaching our boy child, even men in our families, uh, to, to express and be. Because this thing of emotion does not only belong to one gender. Yeah. It belongs to all of us. We are human beings. We have emotions. And therefore, uh, and so many times I would say that, you see, men, because they're not given that platform, they resort to very... Um, destructive behaviors in the society because they, there's no legitimate, I would say, way of venting out how they feel. So the issue of mental, men's mental health, it's something that as a society we need to really be paying attention to and ensuring that it's in the forefront uh, so that we reduce a lot of ills that are committed by men.